You know, when I have a, my first grandchild, her name was Emma, and Trey and Christy gave her a pacifier. Now, me being me, I couldn't just leave it alone and call it a pacifier. I called it a doodler. <laughs> and every time that Emma would wah wah, well, we, I'd say doodler alert, doodler alert. And we'd give her that doodler and she'd stick it in her mouth and it would pacify her. <laughs> I remember whenever they were getting ready to break it, of her or the pacifier, they cut a little hole in the tip of it. I never will forget. She took that pacifier, she stuck it in her mouth. She pulled that thing out, she looked at it, put it back in her mouth, and she threw it down. I looked at her, she was crawling over towards the phone. I guess she was going to call either Earl or James or Rick, have them come service it. I don't know, but <laughs> she put that thing down and she never did pick it back up. But the doodler did exactly what it was supposed to do. It pacified her. It pacified her. I remember whenever they told us that we were going to be grandparents, oh my goodness gracious alive, folks, we were over the top. Could, that's all we talked about that whole afternoon was we're going to be grandparents. I cannot believe that. I'm sure some of you remember that. Got time to go to, to bed and we got in bed and folks, it didn't take me but just a few <coughs> moments to understand that Edwina was suffering from restless nanny syndrome. <laughs> and I knew I had two choices. Choice one is going to be a sleepless night tonight because we ain't through talking about the grandbaby. Choice two, put my foot down as the husband and the head of the house and do something about that. And that's exactly what I did. I told her, get up, honey. Let's go buy something for that baby. <laughs> she got up. She was dressed. She was ready to go before I even could blink. But basically... What did I do? I pacified her. That's exactly what I, I did. And as a country of people, aren't we used to being pacified in our own way? So many times. And I'm afraid, folks. I'm truly, truly afraid. And because of that, So many people walk away from the church and walk away from Christ when we teach them about Christ and we teach them about salvation. We don't go into the fact about what all this is going to entail. We kind of miss the boat there sometimes. You know, Mark writes in the gospel about the sower of the seed and in verse 4 I'm mean, sorry chapter 4 beginning in verse 5 he says another seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil and after that the sun had risen it was scorched and because it had no root it withered away we need to understand folks that as Christians, God is not going to pacify us, as a matter of fact, and in all honesty, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. And when life happens to so many people, and it will, and things does not go the way we want it to go, and it does, God, don't pass, God doesn't pacify us. And so many people, so many people, young Christians, new Christians, they'll walk away. They won't stay with it. But before we look at our text, let's go to God in, in, in prayer. Our Father God, your children assemble today here before you to worship you, the only true and living God. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the power of his word. 
And I pray, Father, that today as I proclaim it, that if I teach anything wrong, Father, that you will defeat me. I pray, Father, that you would forgive us of the sins that we've committed in our lives. And, Father, when you call us home, I pray for a peaceful passing from us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at our, our, our text, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, and when you get there, go down to verse 25. Luke chapter 14. I love hearing turning pages. That's great. The Bible says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, Desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and it is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, The man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not... While the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has and cannot be my disciples. Now folks, there's a lot going on in these verses right now. There are sermons after sermons that can be preached in here. But there's two things that I want us to look at. Number one, it will cost you to be a Christian. And number two, that cost is everything. All that you have. Now that means, folks, that the very first thing that needs to happen in our lives is there needs to be a coup. Now what's a coup? That's an overturn. That's whenever that power is overturned and somebody else takes the authority. Because you see, folks, in our life, there's only room for one throne. And there's only one throne room in our heart. That's it. And there's only room for one person to sit on that throne. And for a lot of us, who's sitting on the throne is self. And not the one that deserves to be there. We've got to dethrone self in order to allow the one who deserves to take the throne to take the throne. You remember the Ten Commandments? One of them says, you shall have no other God before me. Guess what? One of those gods can be self because we can take ourselves and build ourselves up as a God. And a lot of people, that happens, and they never, never realize it. You know, I love looking at bumper stickers. And it's, it, is, it is interesting to me. The devil will take anything in the world he can, and he'll twist it just a little bit. And turn it into a lie and make it sound like it's the truth. I mean, isn't that his M.O.? I mean, he's been doing that from the garden, hasn't he? And he, and he does it sometime in bumper stickers so, so easy that a lot of people, they look at it and they don't think anything about it. For an example, you may have seen that bumper sticker, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Folks, that's the biggest lie in the world. And unfortunately, that lie is going to probably send a lot of people to where they really don't want to go. Because it sounds like the truth. I mean, the Bible says to believe what God says. 
I mean, th that's what it says. And if God says it and I believe it, then that has to settle it, right? No. No, no, no. The truth is God said it and that settles it whether I want to believe it or not. God spoke his word to be followed. And we're going to be judged by every single word that's recorded in here. You know, the Bible. Me working at NASA, we have to have acronyms. Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Here it is. And if you look over at John the Revelator, when he's talking about the books being open, the book of opinion is not one of them. I promise you. This is the book that we're going to be judged out of. Another bumper sticker I saw the other day. God is my co-pilot. Really? You're in the wrong seat. As a matter of fact, if God is your co-pilot, not only are you in the wrong seat, what in the world are you doing in the cockpit to begin with? Because God's got to be the pilot Jesus is the co-pilot. Holy Spirit is the navigator. Well, what about me? I'm in the back serving. That's what I need to be doing. i got to be back there serving. I don't have to worry about that. They know where they're going. I just got to ride along with them. But that bumper sticker, just a little bit. And people will look at that and smile. No, folks. No, 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 no. There's a lot to this. There's a lot to this. It's going to cost us to be a Christian. What's it going to cost? All of our love. All of our time. All of our money. All of our self. Everything. And we have two choices. And they're hard choices. We either pray, or we either play the religion game, Or we go all in. And so many times whenever young Christians start thinking about what it costs them to be one, it's no wonder that a lot of them walk away. It's sort of like the story, that funny story about the chicken and the pig arguing about breakfast. And, you know, finally the pig had had all he could have and said, chicken, look, you just participate. I'm all in. And that's the way that we have to be. You, we literally have to be all in. That's what God calls us to do. But, but, but is it really worth it? That's something we've got to consider. Is being a Christian really worth it? Let me give you three quick things to consider. Just three quick things. And then the lesson will be yours and then you can judge on your own if being a Christian is worth it. Number one, folks, you don't have to go through this alone. You don't have to go through this uh, alone. Nowhere, folks, absolutely nowhere from Genesis to the maps does it say anything about being a long ranger Christian. You will not find that written in this book. God doesn't want you to be a Lone Ranger Christian. That's why God gave you a family, us. I'm an only child here on this earth. And whenever I look out towards you, i got brothers and sisters that's going to live with me for an eternity. And that's something, to be, that's something for me to be happy about. I have family. Family that, that I share a love with that, that always will be there. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Real quick, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's drop down to verse 12. The Bible says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and the, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greek, slaves are free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, 
that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body was an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Amen. Folks, as such, there's so many people around about us that helps you and will help you along with your journey. Whenever I can, I like to catch that show on TV, the Alaskan Bush people. And one time I saw one of the episodes, they had a quite formidable log down on the, on, by the water that they had to get to the homestand. And every one of them walked down to the log, they took their place, they bent over, they picked up part of that log, they put it on their shoulder, and they walked off together going up towards the homestead, every one of them carrying that same log. Now, the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter two, verse two, uh, 6, verse 2, that bear one another burdens so to fulfill the law of Christ. So we don't have to go through this alone. We have others. We have a family that in Christ we get to share each other's burdens. Number two, God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. One of the most disheartening feelings, folks, is a feeling of being alone. Depression is a very slippery slope, my friends. And believing that no one cares, that you have no meaning in life, that you are all alone can trip you up and you can fall down into the depths of depression so, so easy. And if that's the way you feel today, do me a favor. Open your word and go to Psalms 139 and read it over and over and over again. Print it out. Put it on the mirror so you can look at it in the morning. Print it out. Put it on the refrigerator. Do what you have to do, but look at that, look at that chapter every single day if you feel that way. Because of the constraints of, of time, I don't want to read all of it, but beginning in verse 7 of Psalms 139, listen, listen. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed and show, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around about me in, uh, I'm sorry, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is bright as day, for darkness is as light. With you. Folks, God knows. God knows about you in every single solitary way. There is no doubt. There is no doubt that God is there for you. And if there, and if there is, the Hebrew writer says over in chapter 13, listen to, to this, just listen. I will never leave you nor forsake you so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Yes, being a Christian, you better believe it's hard. But you don't have to do it alone. And God will never leave you <coughs> nor forsake you. And number three, number three, and probably the one that I am so so thankful for is Christ Jesus is my intercessor. Now, intercessor, that's not a word that we use much in today's language. But what is an intercessor? An intercessor is someone who intervenes on another's behalf. That's, what, that's, that's exactly what an intercessor is. 
Turn with me over to the book of Romans. As you're turning, if you get to Revelation, you've gone too far. Back up a few. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And let's begin reading in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? If it is God who justifies, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who has raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or darkness, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, it is all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, Neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pause for effect. I want you to do me a favor this morning. I get my class to do this ever so often, and they're getting pretty good with it now. But I want you to go with me through your mind's eye to the very throne room of God. In your mind's eye, I want you to picture the throne room of God. Now, when you get there, back out of the way a little bit so you can see everything that's going on. Because the devil is coming forward. And watch what's about to happen. Because I am about to be accused. I am about to be accused. The devil walks forward and he's about to make his case. Let's listen to what he says. See God, it's Cliff again. How many times has he committed that same sin over and over and over again? He comes to you each and every time and he says, forgive me God. But he goes right back and he does it again. Over and over again. He'll never ever learn. He's a waste of your time. He's a waste of your effort. And even worse than that, God, he's a waste of your son's blood. Man. that's pretty damning evidence that he just got through pulling against me. Kind of makes the palm of my hand sweat a little bit. Well, if Jesus is my intercessor, I sure hope he's got a case. If he doesn't, this doesn't look good for the home team. But Jesus is about to speak. That's Let's listen and see what he says. Father, that devil is right in so many different ways. He's committed that same sin all over again. And you're right, he's come back to you more times than one. And he's asked you for your forgiveness. And he's right back here again asking for your forgiveness again. But look at him. There's something different about him. You see, 
he has a seal of the Holy Spirit on him. Which means that he belongs to you. He's yours. He's yours. He's repented. He set his mind back on you. And he is in the light. And he is continuing to walk in that light. <coughs> Father, don't look at him. Don't look at him. But look at me. I am perfect. I know what he went through. I know what he's going through. I know the temptation he faces every single solitary day because I knew about that. So I know what he's going through. Yes, he deserves death. There's no doubt about it. But, Father, I took that death for him. Me. I died on that cross for him. You said without the shedding of blood, there'd be no forgiveness. That's what I did, Father. I shed my own blood on that cross for him. So when you look down at him, you don't see Cliff. You see the covering of my blood over him. And that sin, you can't see it because you're looking at me. You're looking at me. My blood covers him. I paid that price for him. Whew. Wow. That's pretty dramatic. Pretty good case, I think. But God's about to speak. Let's see what God has to say. God nods to his son. And looks at the devil and say, I forgive him. I blotted that sin out that he had and I remembered it no more. It's gone. It's completely off. See, what sin are you talking about, devil? That sin, my son paid for that sin. My perfect son and his blood covered that. His own perfect blood. And what can we say? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Holy Spirit. <coughs> does it cost you something to be a Christian? You better believe it does. But is the benefits worth it? I think they're out of this world. I really do. If you're a Christian, you don't have to go through this alone. If you're a Christian, you're part of a family. And if you're a Christian, you have an intercessor that intercedes for you to the Father. But he will only be the intercessor for you if you are in him. If you're not in him, he, you do not have an intercessor. Right. And the book of Hebrews says something that just, it, it, the book of Hebrews says something. It's one of those verses that I wish I had white out and I could white it out. Because it literally scares you when you read it. It says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And what does that mean? That means whenever God looks down, there's no seal on you. You don't belong to Him. And the only way you can have that seal is to be in His Son, and He puts that seal of the Holy Spirit on you. Otherwise, the intercessor is quiet. So today, if you're not in Christ... Folks, we can help you. We can help you get that intercessor. We can help you. The water's ready. We can baptize you into Christ. The Bible says that you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That seal will be on you. Christ will immediately start taking up your case. If you have walked out of the light, 
as 1 John says, then the intercessor has stopped interceding for you because you're no longer covered under his blood because you've walked away. But that's okay. That's okay. You can repent. You can come back. We can pray for you. And you can start right back again walking in the light. Thank you, Lord. We worship a God of second chances and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh. So, folks, whatever you desire and however we can help you, please come forward as we stand together and sing.